Welcome, welcome, patrons. One of the most requested media tie-ins I get is for the Dragon Age comics, and while I've talked about many of them, all these comments mean the same thing. A three-part comma that took a little over a year to complete. Each of the three parts are commonly known as the Dark Horse comics, and while this isn't the only Dragon Age series Dark Horse has done, it is the most popular. Because each part is actually very long as far as comics go, this will actually be kind of a small series of videos. So let's just start with the first chapter, The Silent Grove. History. One of the reasons that this series is so highly regarded in the line of media tie-ins is that they were co-written by David Gator, former lead writer of the Dragon Age series. The other co-writer is Alexander Freed, who is credited with the actual script. Freed worked as a writer for Bioware for some time and eventually left right around the publication of this comic to become a freelancer. While us Dragon Age fans might not be familiar with his work, Star Wars fans should, as he worked on Swotar and a large number of novels for the series. The Silent Grove released its first issue on February 22nd, 2012, and released six issues in total, bi-weekly until its finale on May 2nd, 2012. The reviews for this part are mostly very positive, with one of the biggest cons being that the comic builds for something that isn't actually paid off, with many correctly assuming that it's kind of to get readers to continue on with the series until the end of its run. Nowadays, this con really isn't an issue, as most people just read all three parts back to back, so the Silent Grove works well to set up what our heroes will go through in the other two parts. Timeline-wise, the series begins in 938 Dragon, about a year after the events of Dragon Age 2, two years before the novels Mass Empire and Asunder, and three before Dragon Age Inquisition. Something to note about this entire run is that it only technically works in a very specific world state, namely one where Alistair is alive and made king, Sten is recruited by the Warden, and Isabella is not handed over by the Canari. That being said, it's been stated in multiple interviews that the basic story of the series happens no matter what. A Warden, Alistair, and Dragon's Inquisition will actually reference the ending to the series, hinting that even as a Warden, he started this journey. The only questionable world state that would be hard to make any of this happen in would be one where Alistair is just dead. But apparently, that doesn't matter, the basic plot still happens. We're just left with a lot of questions as to how. Another quick fact is that this comic was originally supposed to star Zevran instead of Varric, but this was later changed when they were worried about how the party would interact with one another. He was then supposed to appear in a small cameo, but that too would be cut for time reasons. Sorry, Zevran fans. He is briefly mentioned as being the reason King Alistair has connections with the Crows, though. I will say that the library edition of the series has director notes in the margins. As I do have that copy, I will add any important lore as I see fit. So with that, The Silent Grove. Chapter 1. We open up to Antiva City with Alistair narrating on how he shouldn't be here. He approaches two guards, killing them with the help of Varric, who is looking from above. Isabella is also there, killing another guard who is hiding. Isabella and Varric poke fun at Alistair for being a king. Alistair has hired Isabella, who is an acquaintance, and she has brought along Varric for the ride. The three are breaking into the Antivan Crow's archive. Varric stops Alistair, saying that he almost ran into a trap, so while Isabella and Varric undo the traps, Alistair goes to find what he is looking for. But then, a bright light stops them. It seems they missed the alarm when checking for traps. This is Claudio Valisti, third talent of the Antiguan Crows, a merchant prince, and business partner to Isabella's ex-husband, Louis. He is surprised that King Alistair came personally to raid the archives. Claudio tells the king that he should be glad he was the one to catch him. Alistair then tells him that he had to see for himself, and now he's convinced. And with that, Claudio lets them go. Later, at a bar of Isabella's choosing, she tells of her connection to Claudio, saying that he shouldn't be trusted. But Alistair walks away, saying that he knows that. Varric tells Alistair that he shouldn't be the one to go on this hunt, as he has a reputation to think about, but he brushes off the advice. Varric shrugs it off, asking what they're going to do now. Alistair then tells him that he plans to break into Vela Benchel, a crow's prison, and he's doing it tonight, with or without them. Chapter 2 Outside Vela Blanchel, Isabella climbs out of the water surrounding the place, killing the on-duty guard. Varric and Alistair race inside, while Varric questions what they are doing there. Isabella isn't sure what Varric is doing here even, but she is going to be paid royally no matter what. Overhearing this, Alistair says that he only paid them to get into the archive. If they don't want to help him break into here, that's fine. They can go. He will find a way. No, they will find a way out. Isabella jokes that she's excited for a bathtub of jewels for completing this job, while Varric uses Bianca to hook his way inside the fort. Varric kills a card, but is then caught. Meanwhile, Isabella and Alistair wait outside. Isabella asks why they are here, but he keeps the mystery. 
Isabella whines that he used to be fun, thinking that she thought this was just about having a good old fun adventure. Alistair sulks a bit about how he's not a good king, but both are interrupted by Varric, who is able to open the gate. Crows along with the Canaria are rushing towards them, and Varric tells Alistair to go find what he needs, with Isabella questioning that decision. The Canaria runs to find Alistair, while Isabella and Varric hatch a plan to get out of this alive. As he runs through the prison, he's not sure he's going the right way. The screams of the cells give him flashbacks to his days as a Templar, and he just wants out of here. The Canari catches up with him, but Alistair is able to kill him, taking the keys. He then opens the cell door to find an old man, frail and withered, and who seems to recognize him. Alistair calls out to who he thinks is King Merrick, but the man says that he's too late. Alistair has failed. Chapter 3 Isabella tells Alistair that the crows shouldn't be able to catch them on her boat, and he asks about their guest. Merrick guesses that it isn't who Alistair wanted, and he finally tells him what is going on. He is looking for his father, King Merrick. The man had disappeared 13 years ago at sea. Claudio sent him a message recently saying that evidence of the king had turned up. Merrick then wonders why they saved the old man, but Alistair explains that the old man recognized Alistair as Merrick's son. He knew the king, so he wanted answers. In the ship, the man says that he was Merrick's cellmate. Every day, the crows would question Merrick, but he was never told what about. But one day, a witch of the wilds came to save him. Four years after being captured in the spring, it suddenly became cold. The witch stood outside the gates, demanded Merrick, and the crows gave him away. The old man never saw either again. Both Alistair and Varric comments that they have met Plymouth before and that she tends to meddle, but Isabella says that she isn't the only witch of the wilds, that the stories say that the witches are afraid of another in Antiva. The old man confirms this, saying that it was Yavanna, the beast of the Telari swamps. Varric is dismayed that there is another witch, and Alistair asks for more details. The man tells him that before he left, Merrick told him to tell any children of his that he had to do it and was sorry. Alistair goes above the deck to sulk. When Varric goes to comfort him, Alistair just tells him that Merrick had meant that message for Caelan. He didn't even care that Alistair existed. But that really wasn't so bad, until Caelan died and someone had to be king. It wasn't supposed to be him. Alistair hadn't planned to do all of this, but he has to know. Varric finished his thought that he has to know if Merrick abandoned his son and his kingdom. Alistair asks Isabella if they could go to Talari Swamps, and she agrees. A narration by Alistair tells us that they stop in Slane to drop off the old man with some coin, and while they do try to hire a guide to find the Witch of the Wilds, no one will take the job. Alistair and Varric have a heart-to-heart -heart with Varric asking why he hired Isabella to do this job. Varric is really here for the story, and Isabella is really here to make sure Alistair is okay. Is he worried that his loyal subject would keep him from doing this quest, or allow him to do it? The trio aren't sure what they are looking for when suddenly a giant dragon crashes around them. They go to attack the creature, with Varric calling out to Alistair to run, but are thrown aside. The group is then shocked when the dragon doesn't attack Alistair. He questions if the dragon is Yovana, but then she appears. She is not the dragon, but it seems she can control it. Chapter 4 Yavanna pets the dragon, speaking to it in another language and telling it to return to the grove, which it does so. Alistair wonders why it didn't kill him, which she replies that it could smell his old blood. Alistair tells her to stop with the vague talk. He met Morrigan in Flemeth. Yavanna then asks of her mother, to which he tells her of her plan to possess her daughters to extend her life. Yavanna laughs, saying that Morrigan confuses what it really means and that it is a gift. Yavanna walks away, saying that he can't understand and that he should leave. Varric points Bianca at her, but is stopped by Alistair, who asks what happened to Merrick. She thinks for a moment, but then tells him to follow her. She takes them to the Silent Grove, a place built after the fall of the Imperium by people who knew that dragons need to be protected. Isabella quits back about how tragic it would have been to not have flying monsters, but Yvonne says that the blood of the dragons is the blood of the world, a subject beyond all of their comprehension. Alistair just gets angry, saying that means she doesn't understand it either, but it's just something Flemma told her to say, and that he's just here for Merrick. Yvonne tells him that long ago, Flemma saved Merrick's life. He was allowed to become the ruler until his children were grown, and after that, he was to come here to the Silent Grove, and he agreed to do it. Merrick tells her to just cut the bullshit, asking if she killed Merrick. Yvonne denies this, saying that they should give up the quest, as he is beyond their reach. Alistair draws his sword, demanding that she not turn away from them, but is attacked by vines. Yvonne tells him he was permitted this much out of respect for Merrick. Alistair should take his comfort that his father's life had meaning and leave, with the dragon looming over them and warning. Isabel and Varric cut him loose, and they do so. 
Alistair is frustrated by what happened. Isabella asks what he expected, to which he says he just wants an ending. Varric then suggests they leave when Isabella is struck with an arrow. It's Claudio. Alistair wonders why they'd come to kill him now and not in Antiva. The crow replies that his business with them isn't for the crows. His master wanted to find the Silent Grove, but hasn't been able to. And now they have led them to it. He tells his men to kill all but Alistair. A fight breaks out, but when Isabella is injured, Alistair calls for a surrender. His life for Isabella and Varric. Claudio accepts, telling Isabella to run far. As Alistair is dragged away, he tells the two to find Tegan. He will pay them, and with a thank you, he's gone. Varric tells Isabella that she should get her to her ship before she bleeds to death, but it seems Isabella would rather slit Claudio's throat and save Alistair. And Varric agrees. Chapter 5 In the Silent Grove, Isabella calls out for Yavanna. When they find her inside the building, they inform her of what has happened to Alistair, to which she questions why she should care. Isabella replies that the people who took him are looking for this place and will likely use Alistair's blood to shield against her dragon. Ivana says that she knows of this, and when Isabella expresses confusion, Ivana replies that she didn't care for her fate before, so why should they care now? Isabella wishes to give up, asking Varric to wait on the roof to ambush Claudia when they come back, but he wants to try and talk with Ivana. Varric says that it's obvious that she wants to make a deal and asks for her price. Saying nothing, Ivana heals the group, even taking the bloodstains off their clothes. She tells them to go and save their friend. Varric is confused, saying that she didn't name her prize, but she tells him that he will serve his part. Varric drags Isabella out quickly, with Isabella trying to refute that she isn't really friends with Alistair yet. Later in the Antivan camp, Alistair is talking with Claudio, who is impressed that he came alone to Antiva. Claudio had tricked the heroes into coming here to try and gain access for his unknown patron. He then tells Alistair that if he proves to be more agreeable than his father, he might tell him more about his patron. Alistair questions what his father even did here. But suddenly, an arrow shoots the glass out of Claudio's hand, killing a guard. It's Varric. Isabella then crashes down on Alistair and Claudio, and the two begin to duel. And here we get an interesting clue into Isabella's history. During her surprise attack, she calls out that her ex, Louis, had the same confused look, which angers him. She doesn't deserve to speak his name. As they fight, it's hinted that Claudio had some feelings for Louis and taunts her behavior as Louis's wife. Alistair tells her to go, but she merely says that he isn't her king and continues. Claudio also continues saying if she didn't want to be married, she should have run, not used him for his money. She then gets the upper hand saying he is right, she should have, but she has changed since then. And then she kills him as Alistair calls out for her not to. Isabella frees Alistair from his binds, the two lamenting that his information is on Merrick is lost, but then Yavanna shows up saying that the truth is never out of reach. Chapter 6 Varric marches through the woods, having killed the rest of the guards that were in the camp on his own. He is telling himself that he doesn't have to be the distraction every time, and that he is good at things other than killing guards, which is made even worse when he comes back to more interesting things happening back in the main camp. Ivana then begins her spell. She tells the group that his spirit lingers in the Fade. She stabs his body in the eye socket and begins to ask questions. She asks him who he is, and he replies. She asks him who his master is, but he says he cannot. But Yavanna threatens him, saying that she will pin his spirit to his corpse for all eternity. And finally, as he dissolves into nothing, he yells out Aurelian Titus. Yavanna and the others aren't actually sure who this is, but she is happy to have the name of the man who's been trying to kill her, and tells the heroes that they deserve another chance. But Alistair believes that she's just screwing with them. It's almost dawn when they get back to the Silent Grove. Ivana begins to climb down the pit, telling Alistair that his friends cannot follow, so he goes alone. Inside is a strange cave, full of the dragon and crystal-looking eggs. Ivana calls it the Hall of Sleepers. She explains that when this place was built, the builders called to dragons that still remained and kept them here to sleep, only to reawaken by power. Ivana was the one to come back and awaken the few that had survived the sleep and is responsible for the dragons coming back in the very late Blessed Age. She goes on to say that the great dragons, however, were always beyond her abilities. Merrick had the blood of Kalanhad. Yvonne describes that it called her queen of dragons and woke her up. When Alistair asks how, he says by his blood, as it connects us all. And that is why this Aurelian Titus took Merrick for the power in his blood. She then tells Alistair that he has the same old blood from a time when dragons ruled, a time before the veil. Ivana says that Alistair sees his blood and crown as a curse, but he can use it now for his freedom. 
He can awaken the last of the Great Ones as Merrick was supposed to. His oath will be fulfilled, and then they can search for Merrick together. Once Merrick is found, then he can be king, and Alistair can be his own man again. Alistair holds his head, questioning why everything has to be a ritual. He tells her that her, Morgan, and Flemeth, all they do is manipulate and lie. She argues with him, saying that her purpose is to preserve, and when she asks what his purpose is, he says justice and stabs her. As she bleeds out, he tells her that she was the one who took his father from him, from his brother, from Ferelden. She is the reason why Ferelden tore itself apart. The dragon roars at Alistair, yet does nothing, so he walks away. On the surface, Isabella and Varric question what happened. He says that he killed her, but more importantly, he is tired of being a pawn. He is going to find Aurelian Titus and kill him. Then he will find his father, and then Alistair will continue to be Ferelden's king. Varric smiles, happy that Alistair has finally owned his duty. As they walk away, Isabella jokes that she should ask for another ship, and we end with a narration by Alistair that he is the king of Ferelden, but he hopes he won't do something stupid. Discussion. While I do say this about every comic review I do, I highly recommend actually sitting down and reading this yourself. While some comics shine in the plot and others in the artwork, this one really shines in the writing. The way the story is conveyed in the words is just something I really can't express right in just a small summary of the plot. Granted, this is written by the lead writer of the series, but The Silent Grove is so much more than Alistair hunting for his father. It delves into how Alistair views himself, his relationship with him being king, his family, his relationship with Isabella and Varric, and much more. This comic is well-received for a reason. It really does capture what I think a lot of us love about the Dragon Age series, which is emotional explorations into characters' minds. As a quick fun fact, the original covers to each chapter make up one image, so here is that image in full. Hooray. So a real quick art error that happens throughout this entire run of comics is that Alistair has blue eyes when they actually should be kind of a hazel color. This is the first time we really see Isabella as an actual captain and even get the names of some of her current crew. Now this will actually come up later in the series more in full, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much here, but it is really great to see Isabella in her prime as a captain. In the library edition of the series, Gator admits that Yavanna originally was to live in another part of Thetis, until he remembered that a codex entry existed that mentioned another Witch of the Wilds in the Talari Swamps, so while it looks like he had planned this all along, he didn't. Alistair mentions he has fought three high dragons. If we count the Archdemon as one, and then the others could be the Risen Andraste, and then Flemeth, I guess? Other than that, I'm not sure where else he would have fought a high dragon. Yvonne mentions that Merrick made a deal with Flemeth. This is actually seen in the novel The Stolen Throne, so if you wondered what the promise was that made Merrick look so haunted in the book, this was it. It's hinted at in the comic, then told a bit more bluntly in the library edition, but Claudio loved Lewis. Now, we don't know the full extent of this relationship, but fun facts, I guess. Now, this would also be a part where I explain more of Isabella's past, but that actually becomes a major part of the next book in the series, so you will have to wait for that. Now, probably the most important part of this entire run of comics is the exchange with Yavanna. It seems that there is an order of dragons higher than high dragons called Great Dragons or Queen of Dragons, I guess. One is already awake and lives in the Silent Grove. Maybe it's still there. I'm not quite sure what happened to it after Yavanna dies. And at least one more is sleeping. But more importantly, it seems that the blood that Alistair has is respected very highly with these dragons and they have some sense to not attack people with this bloodline. Alistair's blood is also called old multiple times. This is something that is also said of Canari blood in Dragon Age Inquisition. As it's rumored that the Canari have the blood of dragons, and as we will learn later, so is the blood of Kalenhad, then what makes Alistair's blood more important than the Canari's? Or is it? A small nudge is also that there is a time before the veil, a suggestion that we now know is a major hint that the veil is man-made. To be quite honest, a lot of what Yavanna says has yet to come back up in the series, even though Morgan does repeat a lot of her lines to the Inquisitor during what Pride had brought quest. Morgan and Yavanna were tasked to preserve. How many other daughters does Flemeth have preserving unknown magics? And why are dragons the blood of the world? What does that even mean? How did dragons, which seem to be about as intelligent as a smart dog, rule the world? Or did they used to be more? I have hopes that a lot of what was said here will come back in the future. The question now is, when? And that, dear patrons, is all that we know of the Silent Grove. As a bit of housekeeping, I will be doing the second and third part pretty soon, but I plan to space it out a little bit. 
Next week will be another lore video, then I'll do those who speak, then another lore video, and then the finale until we sleep. So with that, do you still have lingering questions, proof that I'm wrong, comments about your own fan theory, feel free to tweet me at Echolithon on Twitter or send a PM to user Gillanon on Reddit. The rest roll.